Josh Reynolds here for your Tool of the Month video. Myself, Tool of the Month. Just kidding. Chainsaws, obviously. Um, got a few things that we're going to kind of go over with chainsaws. We'll go over like general naming of the parts and stuff like that. Um, I'll break it down for you guys and then we'll talk about cleaning, um, proper way to do Monday checks, and then as well as like some safe cutting habits. So let's jump right into it. So this is your handle wrap. Obviously, you're going to have one hand on the handle and the other hand down here on your trigger. Um, and then this right here is what's called your chain brake. So in order for your chainsaw to run for this blade, I'm sorry, for the chain to spin, uh, your chain brake has to be off. So uh, general parts of the chainsaw here, we have our face plate and then our bar and our chain. Uh, a lot of people call this a blade. Um, these aren't swords. These are chainsaws. Chainsaw bar and chain, okay? And so while we're looking at that, we can kind of dive into that a little bit. So if you look at this chain here, this is what's called a carbide tip chain. So these little guys up front right here, these are called your raker gauges, okay? And then you can kind of see the different color on your tooth right here. That's your carbide tip. So whenever we talk about having uh, no more than five teeth broken off on your chain or three in a row, that's what we're looking for. We're looking to make sure that this little carbine tip piece here is intact still, okay? So uh, orientation of the chain, making sure it's on the right way. This is the way that you want the chain to be on. So your chain is gonna spin this way as it goes. And what the material is gonna do is it's gonna pass over the top of your raker gauge here, which is slightly lower than your tooth. And then, so it's gonna come through this raker gauge and it's gonna be cut by the tooth right here. So this is the correct orientation um, for your chain. So let's dive into this a little bit. <clears throat> As we come over here, we've got our bar nuts and then our face plate. So we take this guy off. And now a little bit of a recommendation slash housekeeping thing. Um, once you get your face plate off, take all of the parts that you're gonna be taking off and place it in your face plate. Uh, that way it ensures that as you're putting it together, you're not missing any pieces and you know that all of your pieces are put back correctly, okay? So in order to take your, your chain or your bar off, you're just gonna kind of lift up at the tip here and then that'll slide it off of this sprocket here and the chain tensioner device. So once we have the bar off and our chain, go ahead and take it down and set that to the side. And then what this exposes is our oiler plate here, um, which you can take off with a star wrench on this model of chainsaw. Go ahead and take that off for you. Once again, on the face plate, so it ensures that I do not lose it. So your oiler plate can be used while cleaning. If you take this bad boy here and we kind of run it along the channel of our bar, um, when we're, we're cutting with our chainsaw, especially like any shingles or anything like that, you're going to get a lot of tar and stuff gummed up in this channel here. So if you take this oiler plate and then just kind of run it along a couple times, uh, it helps get all that gunk out. Okay. So if we come in here and look, um, these are our bar nut stubs here, the posts that the bar nuts go on top of this little piece here. This little flat head is your tensioning screw for your chain, okay? And what that does is as I turn this, as I tighten it or loosen it, it'll move, oops. It moves this guy here, and this is the actual chain tensioner device. This little stub goes inside a hole on your bar here, and that'll push your bar forward or backwards to tighten or loosen your chain. So as we have exposed here, we have our clutch drum and you can see it's free spinning now because my chain brake is off. As I come in here and I apply my chain brake, hear that pop there, uh, and now you cannot spin this clutch drum. So in order to take it apart, make sure that chain brake is off. Now this part could be kind of tricky trying to get the E-clip off. Um, the best recommendation that I have for you guys is to take your scrunch um, or even a smaller screwdriver, like a tuning driver, some sort of flathead device, and then stick a corner of it into this E-clip here, and then kind of use the, the device, or use your screwdriver to spin it up and off like so, okay? This E-clip is actually really, really loose. Um, 
which is something to note. And when you're taking it off, if it comes off super easy like that, chances are you're gonna need a new E-clip. That way it doesn't come off while you're running the chainsaw. Okay, be careful sticking your hands in the way too, just how I did right there. Um, you don't wanna stab your thumb. So just kind of like a twisting motion to get it off initially. E-clip goes on my faceplate. Washer, faceplate, sprocket, faceplate, and my actual clutch drum with the needle bearing. Okay. So that's kind of, of the, um, the basics of, of taking off this side of the chainsaw with our faceplate and, and all the, the intricate moving parts in here. So um, you don't have to clean the chainsaw every single time you use it. Uh, I think using common sense is, is kind of pertinent here. Um, if you take off your faceplate and there's gunk and just stuff all over in here, take it down to the level at which I did right here, all the way down to I'm taking off my clutch drum and my needle bearing. Uh, and clean it and you can run your parts washer in here you don't need to be crazy with it and get the solvent like in every single nook and cranny and make this thing like polished and shined uh, because a little bit of grease and, and film is good these are moving parts these chainsaws spin at anywhere from 10,000 to 12,000 rpm so a little bit of grease and film is is good um, so that's this side of the chainsaw as we move on to the back here this is our air filter housing anytime you guys take off your air filter um, take the trigger here and put it all the way down to full choke, all the way down to the bottom, full choke. And I'll show you the reason why we do that here in a second. So we take this guy off. This is our air filter. And um, for cleaning this, you can take off this little band here. And the best thing you can do is take it on a bench and then just kind of like smack it on a bench or across your leg uh, just to knock that dirt off. And then you can take an air chuck and, and blow this housing out if, uh, if it's really dirty. So then you can take this off as well when you're cleaning and it's just a little clip that just kind of pops off. Okay, so the reason why I had you put it on full choke when you take off this air filter housing, because that little butterfly valve in there closes. And if we take this apart and we don't have it on full choke, that's open. And that goes directly into the carburetor. And so if, you know, we're cleaning these chainsaws in a dirty environment and things happen to get sucked into the carburetor, that's bad news bears, right? So let's make sure we put it on full choke and it closes that butterfly valve in order to eliminate anything getting into that carburetor. Um, another good practice, especially if you're gonna be hitting this with, with solvent, um, if you look down in here, Chief Jardine, if you can get down in here, there's another little port right here, this opening. Um, you can take an earplug and you can kind of shove an earplug right here temporarily while you brush this out with solvent. Uh, we don't want to get solvent in that. So the key with that though is, is make sure we take that back out, guys. We don't want to run our chainsaws with an earplug stuck in there. So um, honestly, best practice might be just to hit this with a, a rag. That way you don't run the risk of forgetting that earplug in there. Um, but if you're trying to go 100%, um, earplug, solvent. All right, we are cruising right along. Um, this is also, so this is your flywheel housing right here. Um, you can take this off if you're doing a deep clean. Um, if you're just doing some kind of like maintenance cleaning, you don't necessarily need to take this off. Um, it's, it's fairly simple, it's just four screws. The only thing to remember is this screw right here, which attaches to your chain brake, is longer. So I'll show you, this is gonna be your long screw. So we take this out and I'll show you. And then your other three screws are this short uh, style here. So just remember, once you take this off, your four screws, one on each corner, you're putting it back together and you're like, what the heck? I got one long screw, where does that go? That goes here to where your chain break is. It's got a little extra material to go through to secure itself versus these other screws. Forgot to mention this at the jump, but I probably should have. This is a steel 461 chainsaw. Um, all the chainsaws on all the apparatuses except for truck one 
are either going to be a 461 or a 441. Um, the 461 and 441 are assembled and disconstructed very, very similarly. Um, it's just a slight difference in the size of the saw itself. So here's your flywheel cover. You've got your pulley in here. Um, you can run all this through parts washer if you want to. Uh, you've got your flywheel in here with your magneto. I'm not going to get into the weeds on, on how this works and how it uh, tells it all to fire and all that. If you really want to get to know that, ask one of your saw dogs. Ask myself, Kroll, Machete, uh, anybody with hey, significant, to to significant chainsaw experience. So that's this side. Um, you can hit this with your, your parts washer if you want to. Um, you don't necessarily need to. I would just recommend taking a, a towel and kind of like cleaning off this, this gunk here. But you don't need to get all in crazy in, in here. So um that's this side of the chainsaw and then as we move forward or you know over here we got this is our muffler um and so that's if i was going to clean the chainsaw this is as deep as i would clean it um and that's like if you were let's say you get a vent job and you actually do cut through some like tar uh, and some st sticky gross stuff then then break it down to this level and clean it uh if you're just down here at the training prop uh or you're just cutting plywood or some kind of wood or anything like that Pop off your faceplate, take off your bar and your chain, uh, and then wipe it down with a rag. You don't necessarily need to take off your E-clip, take off your clutch drum and all that stuff. That's just when you're trying to do a deep clean. Um, and then as always, like if you're unsure on how it goes back together or you're just unsure of, of anything on the chainsaw, um, grab somebody in your crew that can, can walk you through it or just supervise you in doing it, make sure you don't forget to put anything back on. So, um, that's general hey Josh, cleaning. I got a question for you. Yeah. So if we do snap one of our, our pool cable, starting uh -huh. cable uh -huh. ropes, is that something that we could fix pretty easily or is that something we want to send in? Uh, I would send it to Don and, and see what Don wants to do. You can replace these, um, these pull cords fairly easy. Um, it's not a hard thing to do per se skill wise. It's just kind of intricate, kind of a pain in the butt. Um, but I, yeah. If you're comfortable, you're used to, to replacing pull cords on like your weed whackers um, and things like that nature, your lawnmower, it's, it's very, very similar. Then go ahead and do it and just test it and make sure, right? But um, if you're unsure, just um, I would I would send it to station one and let Don decide what he wants to do with that and get a replacement saw. Um, Thanks. Until then, yeah. Um, back it up. So these uh, carbide, like, yeah. how do I sharpen these? These carbide tip chains, you do not sharpen. Um, so our wood chains you can sharpen if you have the correct round file um, and our wood chains look different than these carbine tip chains as in so these are the raker gauges correct these little two pieces right here your wood chain is going to have one raker it's not going to have these two raker gauges and then it's not going to have this carbine tipped uh, tooth on the this is called the tooth here so it won't have that carbine tip piece right there it'll just be a metal piece just your standard um metal so and our wood blades, we just, we don't, we don't sharpen them, right? No, 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 no. Um, yeah, I would not sharpen them. We have plenty of, of chain at station one. Um, if you're gung-ho and you have some felling experience and you've done some arborist work and stuff like that and you feel comfortable, sure. Yeah. But um, yeah, we don't sharpen our carbine tip uh, chains um, or our wood ones in general. So this is a 461. Um, real quick, I want to touch on, these are 500i chainsaws. And for all you guys that know, you can look at the, the flywheel cover here and it'll tell you what kind of saw it is. And it tells you the displacement and all that on the handle. This is getting into the weeds, don't worry about that. So 500i, there's two 500i chainsaws we have. They're both located on truck one. Um, they come apart very similar to the 461s and 460s. Um, however, these are fuel injected chainsaws. So there's not a carburetor that has any tuning uh, in it like the 461s and 441s that we have. So uh, still kind of comes apart the same um, with your, your, your face plate here and your bar nuts. These bar nuts are attached in the face plate, slight nuance, flywheel cover, your exhaust, all that. So they're, they're slightly different. The starting process on them is a little bit different versus the, the 461s. Um, so, but other than that, they cut the same. These are a little, little stronger and a little bit lighter chainsaw than these 461s. All right, guys, so something I wanted to touch on here too. Um, when you're putting this clutch drum back on, so I've got my needle bearing on, right? That's the first piece that goes on here, needle bearings on. And now if Chief Jardine can, right in here, there's a little key. I'm not sure if you're able to get that or not. 
Looks like it. Yeah, so there's a little key right there. Um, and there's a notch cut out on this clutch drum. So if you look on the top side of it as well, there's a little scoring, scoring, and that tells you where that notch is. So you need that notch to line up on that key uh, in order to get the clutch drum seated on there all the way. So it's important to locate that, find that notch there, and then you can put it on and it goes straight on. And how you know it's on all the way is if it's flush with your needle bearing here. So let me take this off real quick and I'll show you when it's not. So you do see the difference there. Um, it's not seated flush with my needle bearing in here. So that's how I know it's not on correctly. Uh, and if you get it like this, sometimes you're able to kind of just rotate to hear that click. So it dropped into that keyhole there. And now I'm sitting flush with my needle bearing and I know it's on. All right, guys. So I'm going to show you a little tip for getting your bar and your chain um, back on here. Um, so we'll take our chain. Does not matter which way you orient it at this point. Okay. So we've got it on our sprocket here. The only thing that matters, so I'm going to lift it up from the tip. I want to make sure that my chain falls in the channels on both sides. Okay. Pull tension at the bottom of your chain here. And then if I do that, I can just let go and I don't have to worry about trying to keep my chain in the channel here. It'll stay in that channel automatically. Okay. So at this point, uh, I need to get my chain around my sprocket, correct? So what I'll do, pull tension at the tip of the bar. And then I'm just going to continue to pull tension with my right arm or my right hand here at the tip of this bar. And then I'll be able to finagle it over that sprocket. And then I'm looking to make sure that the chain tensioner pops through this hole here. Okay, so that's the device that moves forward and backwards to loosen and tighten your chain. So a couple things to check here. You've got your posts in your, your cutout here. Your chain tensioner is in the hole and your chain is lined up in the sprocket correctly. So that's the best way to do it, you guys. It's very, very easy. Um, I know a lot of people struggle to try and keep the chain in here and get it onto here. As soon as you get that chain on your sprocket at the tip of the bar and you have the chain lined up in the channel, just hold it upside down, okay? And then pull tension and put it on. Um, and then verify that our chain is on the correct way. So facing the correct way with our raker gauges, right? Because the chain's gonna travel along this path. So that's just a quick little tip to get your chain on. And you know, it can be frustrating at times. Okay, so next thing we're gonna go over is tightening your chain. Uh, how tight's too tight? Um, how tight should it be? So you cannot tighten or loosen your chain um, with your bar nuts cinched down. So you need to make sure that your bar nuts are loose. Okay, so um, another thing, if I, if I put tension at the tip here of my bar, you can see that I gain a lot of space here. So I'm just gonna kind of get these bar nuts finger tight for now. So you got them finger tight on there. And then what I like to do is I'll take my chainsaw and I'm gonna do it this way for you. I'll set it down like so, that way my chain can hang down. Um, so this right here is way too loose. If the chainsaw is just sitting as is and you've got your drivers, which are these little guys here showing through the bar, then that's way too loose, okay? So we'll take our scrunch here, insert it, Righty tighty, lefty loosey. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get it like kind. I'm gonna get it kind of tight to where it feels there's some tension there, and then I'm gonna take my chain and I'm gonna spin my chain because um, sometimes that can loosen it up as well. So I pull here. That feels a little. That feels pretty good. Um, remember, once you actually tighten your bar nuts down as well, it will tighten this chain some more. So keep that in mind as you go. And you might get it to the perfect amount of tension here, but it's going to become tighter when you tighten your bar nuts down. So I'm there. That feels pretty good to me. Um, don't hulk this thing down. Like, let's just be smart about it. Get it tight, but don't cinch it down like crazy. You don't want to break those these studs here. Don will not be happy. Okay, so that's on, and I'm gonna pull tension here, and that looks pretty good. So, you know, it's hard saying exactly. Uh, it's more of a feel thing, but I'm pulling some decent amount of tension, and it's it's showing a couple of drivers there. Uh, as you run your chainsaw, 
everything is metal, right? So it's gonna expand. So it's gonna loosen up a little bit. So that's the correct amount of tension um, right there. So um, let's go into some safe cutting habits right now. Um, hopefully you guys are familiar with this area of your bar. So this right here, if I were to take, if I were to go from like right here to right here, I would call this zone in the middle here, it's called your kickback zone. So it's very, very dangerous. Never ever cut with this part of your bar. What that's gonna do, this chain is spinning, you know, these, these saws run at like 10,000 RPM, right? So this chain is just whipping. And if you cut right here, with that part of the bar, what it's gonna do is it's gonna kick back. So it'll kick back into your face. Um, if you're down like this and you're cutting, it'll kick back into your arm or your shoulder. And it's very, very violent. It happens very fast and you can't control it. That's what this chain break is for. If you're cutting and it kicks back, it should break and stop the chain, right? So ideally we'd like to avoid that. So I'm not saying that you cannot cut with the top of your bar. That's totally okay if you're comfortable enough to do that. Um, but just be aware that that's, there's a kickback zone right here. So if you're, if you're cutting on a roof and you're trying to plunge in and do your first initial cut, do not, do not cut like this, right? I know when we're making our cuts, we want to have the saw as vertical as possible because the best way to feel the members. However, when you're going in, be at a little bit more of a shallower angle. Once you get that in, then you can come up and use the top of the bar, right? We don't want to initially make our cuts straight down because that's how you're going to get a kickback, okay? Never ever cut with that kickback zone. That's how you cut yourself or your partner. Um, another thing that I want to bring up, um, when we do our cuts and we're finished cutting and we pull our saw out, uh, a lot of people like to jam this chain break on while it's still spinning full RPMs. That is horrible for these chainsaws. Um, the way that the clutch drum and the clutch brake is in here, uh, you can break those clutch brakes and it is a pain in the butt to replace. So finish your cut, finger off the trigger, let it idle down, and then if you need to walk around with the chain brake on, put your chain brake on and go. Don't, don't engage your chain brake while this is spinning at full speed. It's very, very bad for these chainsaws. Um, safe cutting habits, right? Don't cut towards your feet. Um, be athletic, be in like a little squat stance. Um, we can go into the nuances of cutting at some other time if you guys have questions on, on five cut center louvers and all that. There's tons of saw dogs out there and Chuckies who are very familiar with that. But be smart, don't cut towards yourself. Do not cut on this kickback zone. I cannot harp that enough. That's very violent and very dangerous. It happens very fast. Okay, so next thing we're gonna go over is tightening your chain. Uh, how tight's too tight? Um, how tight should it be? So you cannot tighten or loosen your chain um, with your bar nuts cinched down. So you need to make sure that your bar nuts are loose. Okay, so um, another thing, if I, if I put tension at the tip here of my bar, you can see that I gain a lot of space here. So I'm just gonna kind of get these bar nuts finger tight for now. So you got them finger tight on there. And then what I like to do is I'll take my chainsaw and I'm gonna do it this way for you. I'll set it down like so, that way my chain can hang down. Um, so this right here is way too loose. If the chainsaw is just sitting as is and you've got your drivers, which are these little guys here showing through the bar, then that's way too loose, okay? So we'll take our scrunch here, insert it, righty tighty, lefty loosey. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get it like kind, I'm gonna get it kind of tight to where it feels there's some tension there. And then I'm gonna take my chain and I'm gonna spin my chain. Um, Cause sometimes that can loosen it up as well. So a pull here, that feels a little, that feels pretty good. Um, remember once you actually tighten your bar nuts down as well, it will tighten this chain some more. So keep that in mind as you go. And you might get it to the perfect amount of tension here, but it's gonna become tighter when you tighten your bar nuts down. So I'm there, that feels pretty good to me. Um, don't hulk this thing down. Like, let's just be smart about it. Get it tight, but don't cinch it down like crazy. You don't want to break those, these studs here. Don will not be happy. Okay. So that's on and I'm going to pull tension here and that looks pretty good. So, you know, it's hard saying exactly 
Uh, it's more of a feel thing, but I'm pulling some decent amount of tension and it's, it's showing a couple of drivers there. Uh, as you run your chainsaw, everything is metal, right? So it's gonna expand. So it's gonna loosen up a little bit. So that's the correct amount of tension um, right there. So um, let's go into some safe cutting habits right now. Um, hopefully you guys are familiar with this area of your bar. So this right here, if I were to take, if I were to go from like right here to right here, I would call this zone in the middle here, it's called your kickback zone. So it's very, very dangerous. Never ever cut with this part of your bar. What that's gonna do, this chain is spinning, you know, these, these saws run at like 10,000 RPM, right? So this chain is just whipping. And if you cut right here, that part of the bar, what it's gonna do is it's gonna kick back. So it'll kick back into your face. Um, if you're down like this and you're cutting, it'll kick back into your arm or your shoulder. And it's very, very violent. It happens very fast and you can't control it. That's what this chain break is for. If you're cutting and it kicks back, it should break and stop the chain, right? So ideally we'd like to avoid that. So I'm not saying that you cannot cut with the top of your bar. That's totally okay if you're comfortable enough to do that. Um, but just be aware that that's, there's a kickback zone right here. So if you're, if you're cutting on a roof and you're trying to plunge in and do your first initial cut, do not, do not cut like this, right? I know when we're making our cuts, we want to have the saw as vertical as possible because the best way to feel the members. However, when you're going in, be at a little bit more of a shallower angle. Once you get that in, then you can come up and use the top of the bar, right? We don't want to initially make our cuts straight down because that's how you're going to get a kickback, okay? Never ever cut with that kickback zone. That's how you cut yourself or your partner. Um, another thing that I want to bring up, um, when we do our cuts and we're finished cutting and we pull our saw out, uh, a lot of people like to jam this chain break on while it's still spinning full RPMs. That is horrible for these chainsaws. Um, the way that the clutch drum and the clutch brake is in here, uh, you can break those clutch brakes and it is a pain in the butt to replace. So finish your cut, finger off the trigger, let it idle down, and then if you need to walk around with the chain brake on, put your chain brake on and go. Don't, don't engage your chain brake while this is spinning at full speed. It's very, very bad for these chainsaws. Um, safe cutting habits, right? Don't cut towards your feet. Um, be athletic, be in like a little squat stance. Um, we can go into the nuances of cutting at some other time if you guys have questions on, on five cut center louvers and all that. There's tons of saw dogs out there and Chuckies who are very familiar with that. But be smart, don't cut towards yourself. Do not cut on this kickback zone. I cannot harp that enough. That's very violent and very dangerous. It happens very fast. Um, and don't cut towards yourself, yeah, so. All right guys, welcome back to the Tool of the Month video. So, uh, basic starting uh, steps of the chainsaw. So. Your trigger here, it's in the off position. Um, and then if you go down one, that's your run position. Uh, and then in order to get it down to your next mark here, that's your three quarters uh, clut or choke, sorry. You have to push down on the trigger and get it down. So full chokes all the way at the bottom. So we have to pull our trigger to get it all the way down at the bottom. So if you're starting a chainsaw that has not been ran recently, you wanna go all the way down to full choke, okay? Hold the trigger, hold the safety, all the way down to full choke. And you wanna pull it roughly three to maybe five times. Uh, three to four is kind of that money zone. You should hear a pop, okay? And by the pop, uh, you'll hear it's an increase in RPMs and the saw will kind of rev up for a second, like whoo. And so that tells you that the carburetor is now good to go. So you're gonna hold the chainsaw, um, there's a couple different techniques to starting as far as you can put it down on the ground. Uh, you can put your foot in through this handle here. I've got it on full choke and you can start this way. This is definitely one of the safer ways to do it. Um, or you can also, this is how I do it, I don't know, it's the right way. I'll put the handle between my legs here. So this will secure the, the, the saw from not being able to move around. So I'm here, I'm full choke and I reach down in here. I'm gonna give it three pulls if it doesn't burp on that third pole, I'll give it one more. Uh, and then after that, I should be worried about it being flooded, okay? Flooded is when 
if you have too much gas in the carburetor uh, and it's what it does is it soaks your spark plugs and the environment is too moist and warm in there for for the saw to start so you hear that pop and then you go up back up into run right so that's gonna be that guy there that's your run position okay and then um give it another pull maybe two or three and it should start for you okay I got a question so, for you yeah what is that button do yes yeah, so this is your decompression switch um you can push that down to start it Basically, um, you get a bunch of compression built up in the piston housing, uh, and it makes pulling this pull cord extremely hard. So if you're noticing that and you're like, God, that's like, it shouldn't be that hard. Come up top here, push that decompression switch, uh, and then it'll alleviate any of your issues uh, pulling it. So uh, let's say you're on a scene and you're tasked with, with using the chainsaw in, in whatever manner, and um, you do flood the chainsaw. You pull the chainsaw six or seven times on full choke and it's not running. Um, maybe it bounced around your compartment and gas got in the carburetor and it flooded it. Um, the chainsaw is flooded. My recommendation would be to find a new chainsaw. You can, um, you can unflood these uh, pretty easily. Uh, it's just time consuming. Um, and especially in an adrenaline provoking environment um, when things need to happen like now, uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna take more time for you to unflood a chainsaw than it would be just to grab another one. So my recommendation would be, it's flooded, okay, go grab a new chainsaw. Don't try and mess with it and unflood it and sit here for 15 minutes or 10 minutes trying to pull this thing and exhausting yourself. So if it's flooded, grab a new saw. What if I've been working for a little bit, I turn my saw off, we go do some other things and I come back and I yeah. wanna start it. Yeah. What's the so, best procedure for that? Yep, so in a situation like that, um, Let's say you're doing some cutting or whatever, and then you guys get off the roof uh, during training and you grab a bite to eat or something like that. And then you come back to your saw and you want to start it again. Um, more than likely, you're not going to need to choke the saw. So you're not going to need to put it on full choke down here. More than likely, you can just put it in the run position and start it. So what I would do um, is if the saw has been sitting for, you know, a period of time under an hour, um, I would try and start it on, on run before I go to choke because you can easily flood these things and it's just a pain in the butt. There's no harm at all in trying it on run first. So if you've been running it for a while, turn it to run, pull it like six or seven times and it should go. If the saw is cold, it's been sitting overnight and hasn't been ran yet that day, yes, you have to put it on choke. If you ran it earlier in the day, just give it a try on run first. That's your best option. Um, which brings me to my next point, um, about Mondays. So, um, as you guys are all aware, every Monday we start our chainsaws, we make sure they run and, and all that. So to do a proper Monday check on these things, um, we want to start the chainsaw and then let it idle, right? So let it idle for five minutes, let it idle for 10 minutes, whatever. Let it get warm in there, right? We have metal moving parts in here that are going to expand with heat. Okay. So if we start our chainsaws um, and then we just all of a sudden just rev it up as high as it'll go uh, and then let it off and then say, oh, that's good. And then we shut it, we turn it off. Um, that can cause damage to the cylinder inside of these chainsaws. You can scar that cylinder in there. So proper start and cool down techniques, just like you would for any other sort of, of piece of machinery with an engine, right? So we'll start it, we'll set it down, we'll let it idle for a little bit We'll go start our, our, our other saws. We'll go do something else for a second, come back, and then um, rev it up slowly. So um, I don't mean like just doing a half throttle on this and then a three quarters throttle and then full throttle. These are two stroke engines, much like all other two stroke engines. They either like to be ran all the way open full speed or at idle. They do not function well in the in-between zone. So give it a couple good pops of pulling the trigger all the way up. Vroom, 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 vroom. Pardon my sound effects. It's amazing. So, um, and then once it's been, it's been idling for a while, you do some of those and then you can hold it full bore all the way open for a second, you know, maybe a second and a half um, and then let it idle down on its own. Do not hit the chain brake and then let it cool down and idle on the ground for another five minutes by itself. Let that, chainsaw cool down after it's been running at that high RPM, right? These things, these things roll so hot. Like it's important to warm up, warm them up correctly and cool them down correctly. Um, and then that, that's your Monday check, right? And then come back and make sure you've got enough gas and oil in here 
um, mixed gas. We don't do straight gas in these chainsaws uh, and your bar oil. So uh, we have all pre-mixed gas for these. It's the VPN stuff um, and the blue containers. So this should be uh, somewhat easy for you guys. Is there a technique on, on uh, like testing that the bar oil is getting kicked out onto the chain? Yeah, I mean, um, so there's a couple ways that you can do that. One of them is when you're cutting or you have the chainsaw running, you can hold your bar down close to the concrete, right? Like this, if this is my concrete here, about yay far away. And uh, what that'll do is it'll spit oil. You should see some oil residue coming onto the concrete. Um, another way for that is actually like, if you're running the chainsaw and it's smoking for whatever reason and you haven't dumped any oil on your um, muffler there, then it's probably not getting enough oil. And there's an oiler adjustment screw on the bottom here. Um, if that's the case, contact Don and we'll, we'll go that route with it versus you guys trying to monkey wrench with it. Um, and then also every time you fill this thing up, you need to check your oil, right? And then that'll tell you if uh, it's been oiling properly, right? So like if I run through a whole tank of gas on here and then my oil is full, chances are it's not using enough bar oil. The ratio is not perfect. You're not gonna go through a whole tank of gas and a whole tank of oil. You'll probably go through a tank of gas per half to quarter tank of, of oil. So as long as you see some, you have less oil in here than when you started, um, then you know that your chain is being oiled properly.